I'm Jack Harvey, and this is The Skinny. From the Fatheads Eyewear Studios in Speedway, Indiana, this is The Skinny. Brought to you by Toyota, Rhino Classifieds, General Tire, and Dream Giveaway. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by General Tire. It's more than just a slogan. Anywhere is possible with General Tire. General Tire's Grabber X3 Mud Terrain Tire offers aggressive styling and is engineered for durability with innovative performance features that are ready to carry you through extreme mud, dirt, and rock-covered terrain. For extreme traction that's ready for anything and rugged styling to match, look no further than the Grabber X3. Make your anywhere possible by visiting GeneralTire.com today. Boy, looking forward to a great show here once again on The Skinny. Ken Statwee, the track dude, Michael Young, has joined me once again to fill in for Rico. Plenty of room left inside of that chair here today. And we also have to welcome here Mr. Jack Harvey. Jack, thanks for taking the time, man. Welcome to The Skinny. Thank you. This is actually a super cool setup. I'm super impressed. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, we undersold it. He, he thought he was going to come and do like a closet and do like a little small little <laughs> did. microphone and, yeah. and, and some old Remember, Sony no, Walkman. You, you've been on a bunch of these, uh, you know, as I researched it a little bit. You've been on a bunch, so you don't know what you're walking into, right? I've been on a few. I thought it was just going to be one of them things where we sit down with like a voice recorder and we just chit chat back and forth. And then I came in and saw the shooting and was like, wow, actually, I can't say what I said because... I get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> we can beep it out. Carl's good at that. Trust <laughs> we had Shane Tecklenburg on here. He's, he's had good practice. More F-bombs than Rico and I could throw as a, as a team. So uh, he's, he's queued up. <laughs> the, problem, the problem is Brits just casually swear a lot. And it just flows for me. And that's really bad because sometimes I don't even realize I'm doing it. So then I get in like a, a corporate situation and I really have to check myself. So I appreciate knowing that the bleep is an option today. Well, it's, it's, what I find funny is that the Brits use some of the some of the off-color language differently than we use over here. And hmm. Carl, I'm going to put you to the test here, so we'll pause for just a second. But you guys use the word as a regular... Oh, yeah. It's like us saying over here. It's like, oh, he's a... It's, you know, but you say it over here, it's like, oh, my God, fighting words. You know, you're you're dead, man. <laughs> I, have a, I have one story about that because i completely agree in the uk like so I, I don't know if i can bring myself to say it but it's like <laughs> we call it casual <laughs> and it honestly like between friends it's almost like endearment you know that's the thing like, and it is and if you've ever chatted to like matthew brabham when he's not got a, a you know a recording device in front of him i mean that it's just how we are you know it's just like the kind of the culture and i remember i dropped it that word in a engineering meeting once and it, it didn't get received with the <laughs> laughter that I thought it was going to. I thought it was going to be like one of them like icebreaker moments and the eerie atmosphere that overcame our engineering room. I was like, wow, this, this, uh, uh, which, sorry about that. I guess I uh, shouldn't use that word over here. It's not got the same ring. It's uh, yeah. When so, you're over here, that is, I'm, I, argue if i'm wrong i that's can't the, the most intense word of yeah. any curse word you can it, say in the states the thing is even in the uk if, if you say it with malice and you and it's very direct i mean that that's like the epitome of fighting talk you know yeah. i mean it's pretty much on between friends you get away with it i gotta be honest I, i'm not i i hate that word you well know, i mean like the, i'm never the, i'm never the, keen on using it i save it for extreme situations so then when i say it it tries to have the gravitas behind it that I want. So it's in your arsenal. You just it's in my arsenal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. It's just like the F-bomb over here, right? You can say, you know, he's my effing buddy, or I hate that effer, you know? I mean, yeah. it can go either way Context. if you want to use it, you know? Yeah. Context you know, and intent. You talk about vulgarities, and people, I have... I'm pretty loose with vulgarities and every other word at some times. I don't even realize I'm doing it. And they say, well, how do you even get on the radio? How do you do things without swearing all the time? And it's like there's a switch that you it know when weird, you. Yeah. So I, I tell everybody, I try to get it out of my system. Sure. So when I'm in these environments. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's why we use so much when we're off the air Correct. so that, you know, we even out when we're on the air. <laughs> They're just like good descriptive words. I find like they sometimes are. I just don't know how else to say it. There's apart so much from, like, emotion the attached, right? I there mean, is. <laughs> Gary's weight. So we're back from Nashville. Yeah. A hot, long, but a very intense race weekend. Yeah. What a sh <laughs> I want to say what a show it was. It was an interesting you race. You nearly got yeah. caught into I, our last yeah, conversation. Yeah, yes. The fans 
were, they came out in droves. It was uh, awesome. uh, one of our most well-received races in the last five years. Definitely. Race wasn't quite what we hoped it to be from your vantage point. Mm. Assess the weekend. Uh, I would say as an event, it was awesome. It lived up to all, it lived up to all the hype that we all felt like it was going to. It, as soon as it was announced, there was just this atmosphere around it and this, you know, energy that only really is reserved for the Indy 500. And then suddenly we get there and it's still like the euphoria of the moment. I mean, everyone's walking around, you know, on like cloud nine. You got like an extra spring in your step, which was useful because we had to walk over that bridge every day to get to the track. <laughs> Um, the race itself was a disaster, really. I think we can all agree on that. But you see the the ratings it got back, and clearly it did very well. So, I mean, on the whole, the event itself I thought was fantastic. Definitely things we need to try and clean up for next year, maybe. Um, the, the nicest thing about it, the, all the promoters and everyone who would put that race on, they want the feedback. They want it to be a great event. And like any event, the first one sometimes has some... You're dealing problems, learn. you're going to learn a bunch. And uh, I mean, ultimately, in some, I feel like the drivers also have to take some responsibility for having a clean and successful race. I mean, we all know what the consequences are. A lot of time running too wide at a street circuit and it's someone ends up in the wall and on such a tight track, it's a, it's a yellow flag, it's a red flag. And I mean, I don't even know what the longest green period was. But I mean, from where I was, I thought the race was never going to end. You know, you get three laps to go and you got a red flag and you're like, really? You know, like how many yellows we've had and suddenly they get a red flag and you're like, cool. Like, I was, it was a mess. I, you're sitting in the car cooking. Well, and It I, was warm. It was definitely toasty. It, was, it was warm. I joked and said, it was like 6.45 and I said, it's getting a little, and I used the word dusky, which isn't even a word, but I was trying <laughs> yeah, to describe nice. it. It's starting, yeah. it's starting to get sure. dark. Right. And by the time it was over and we had another red flag in there, they did the victory podium celebration basically in the dark. Yeah, they for sure did. By the time we had, I was a bit miffed after our race, so I, I got changed. I said thanks to the guys, and I pretty much like left pretty quickly. And as we were walking over the bridge, I mean, it was it was dark, you know, and that's what half an hour from like the checkered flag. So it's pretty cool because you get to see some pretty wicked photos, you know, after it, and like this, you know, seeing Marcus celebrate and you know, basically the pitch black with all the cool lights was. Uh, was wild, but it also shows what a wild race that was when you literally saw the whole bottom of his car, like the whole underwing, and then he wins the race. You know, Absolutely. so it was it was great in so many ways. It was super unpredictable. Uh, we didn't come on the right side of that, but uh, I would say Nashville was probably the number one race of the year that people wanted to go to, at least who I talked to and you know, my family and, you know, things like that. It seemed like everybody wanted to be in Nashville. If you had to change, I was going to say three, but let's just make it one. What would be the one thing to change in that race for next year that you say this would help it the most if we did what? Ugh. I've got one. I think I think one thing that was, was hard in Nashville was the way the, the pits worked. Then there was that one yellow because of, don't remember exactly who was stuck in turn one, but it was quicker to basically take a full service and come out ahead, yeah, I, which is a little weird, you know, in a pit sequence. So I think depending on where the accident in the track is that they should close the pits because that to me seemed a little, not necessarily unfair. I mean, it's good job for the guys who registered and recognized what was going to happen there quicker, but, um, I think it was Colton Herter that pulled in, did a full service, came back out, and almost ended up behind the pace car. Right. Renus VK was, yeah. was wadded up into turn one, so the pace car had to slow to get around Renus's car. In right. the meantime, these guys are flying and doing the pits, and, and as soon as they hit the line where the rev limiter shut off, Colton almost passed the pace car and was going to lap the whole field. Sure. And the thing that I thought was weird as well was – how they determined the blend line, you know, people coming out of the pits and like where they were in turn one. I think that could be a little clearer because I, I saw a few people and they basically draw this like imaginary line because the team were like, okay, you need to go ahead of these cars. I'm like, wait, like, why? Like, I'm really confused as to what's going on. The other final thing I'd probably do, and I love that IndyCar do this because it promotes racing straight away, but on a tight circuit like that, 
I don't think on a restart you should be able to overtake before you cross the finish line. Because a great example was when Will Power and Simon Pagano came together. We've gone from one yellow to immediately into. Actually, that might have even caused a red. That did, yeah. that did cause yeah. a red because it stacked them all up. And, yep. and it was that accordion effect where they're coming down. They're trying to catch the lead group. Then they catch them at, at accordions, and they all stack up, and then they fan out to keep from running into each other. And then I'm sure the spotter said green, 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 because by then the front is ready to go green. And then you've got Will Power thinking, well, I'm down here. I'm well, underneath him now. I might as well take the spot. 100%. And then it causes a wreck. And the thing is, like, at the end of the day, as, as a driver, as soon as they go green, you're going forward. You know, And in that moment, I think the series could do a little bit better going, we're not going to shout the green until you get to the the finish line or whatever or, or something that takes that opportunity away because if you give drivers the opportunity yes we're going for it would it have been better to do all the restarts going into nine and do it on the bridge as opposed to that's, maybe that's oh, my one off. fix where you guys started the race mm. i thought was brilliant it gave everybody a chance to run down there get a little bit of a gap and and i think it worked out great so i think all the restarts should have been backed up onto the bridge i would have said going into nine one thing that they could do next year that would be which i think would allow us to do the restart there is actually have a part of the track like they do at Indy and where you, you can't exceed the white line. Like there might still be more space over there, but you don't exceed the white line because going into turn nine is so wide. You know, honestly, you could get four cars there. And if you have a restart that gets a bit fruity or something like that, I mean, you are going to see, you know, three cars go side by side into a pretty sharp, but also fast left-hander. So I think they could map out the actual, or they could define the track better in those moments, I think. Copy. We're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be right back on the other side with more from the Meyer Shank driver, Mr. Jack Harvey. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Toyota. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Rhino Classifieds. Tired of all those ads and random stuff that shows up when you're looking to buy or sell your car parts? Rhino Classifieds was created just for you. Welcome to a streamlined buying and selling app created by racers for racers and race fans. Modified cars, classic cars, race cars, that special big block you need. The trailer to move your baby around the country in. We got you at rhino.co. So in the studio with us is Mr. Jack Harvey. Had a great chat already about uh, Nashville. You know, I'm just going to uh, jump off of that racing thing and, and go a little broader for the season. Your career has been phenomenal. Uh, no question about that. But, man, if I take a look at just this year alone, you've qualified in the fast six, six times out of the 11 races we've had. And to see that you're 14th in the points is certainly not a reflection of the ability of that team and your driving. True. But, man, you've been in this game for a little while. And if anything that can go wrong will go wrong, it goes wrong at the worst possible time. And, man, you have just been snake bit time and time again. Uh, yeah. I mean, it kind of feels like it this year. I mean, it's kind of hard to, uh, you know, say we haven't been. Um, ooh, it's a slippery slope. You know, and I think well, the thing that as a team we've tried to avoid feeling is, oh, we just have all this bad luck. Like, I'm not sure I believe in that. The only bit of bad luck I feel like we've really had this year was Indy 500 qualifying when we had that weird deal with the tire basically had two patches missing out of it. Firestone never seen anything like that. I've never had it again. Uh, we actually have a photo of that. I actually took that yeah. photo. And there is another blister on the bottom of that. It's and wild. It, you started out, I think your first lap was one of the quickest, and then you fell off and then fell off. Yeah. And then you're, I think it was a 225 by the time you were done. I was like, what the heck happened to Jack? Could you feel and, it vibrating? Two, 225 might have been the pace I was about to like, <laughs> myself, honestly. <laughs> Fair enough. But that's what you came into. And then there was another yeah. blister on the bottom side. That was on the right rear, correct? It was, yeah. And how did that feel going around that felt place? felt horrendous. And you stuck with it. Well, you know, the, it's a tough one, right? Because you look back at it and I honestly think now all the dust has settled and that was extremely reckless on everyone's part to stay out there for that because, I mean, that thing, how it even stayed intact, I thought was an incredible effort by Firestone, really. Uh, we, we still don't know how it happened. I felt it almost immediately. I radioed the team and said, I've got a huge vibration. 
and they had to recalculate the scale to see the severity and it then because it happened there and then affected all the other tires as well so all the tires ended up being off the chart bad uh for vibrations i said to the guys like why didn't you just pit me because again 10 years from now i probably would just pit myself i still feel like i've got a lot to prove you know and i want to be out there and i've been on the other side of or oh, not the completely bad side of bump day but i've been through the stress of bump day and to me that was clearly a just a a random issue that you know firestone hardly ever have them i was like guys just pit get the car ready put another set on let's just go again i mean it didn't see i mean obviously that's a big deal i think we could have handled that better in the moment i will say the guys did a brilliant job turning the car around and then actually when we came time for our qualifying run we actually had a pretty competitive run in the heat of the day and i was like oh, i was pretty pretty happy with that uh just disappointing that it happened that way so you look at the season and you see where we've been qualifying um great saturdays you know no no doubt we've had a lot of really strong saturdays uh we're just not quite getting it right on sunday and i think that's the the hard truth of the year is um it's not necessarily bad luck because eventually one of these times it would swing in your favor if you believed in luck and right now sadly it's not swung in our favor so it has to be decision making you know and that's what we've chatted about a lot as a team this season is what's the decisions why are we making these decisions because if you don't understand why we're making them we're never going to be able to fix them and granted nashville clearly was a wild race you know so maybe that was a little bit of an exception but um we've had a huge amount of potential and i think that's the thing that has kept everybody going we know how good the team can be i feel like i'm doing a good job in the car we just we just need to get the end result i mean i i hate to say it, we're ticking almost every box we're just not ticking the box that matters the most yeah i i, I couldn't agree with you more when, whenever you say bad luck you know when a wheel gun fails that's that's kind sure. of a bad luck deal but if you you know if you go to road america and i'm not real sure what dictated the three stopper versus the two stopper you know when you take a look at some of that stuff you scratch your head it's like man we were so close we were at the front and and sure. uh you know just what why did we do that or like you were just talking about before it's but it, it just goes to show you how competitive this deal is i mean sure. the smallest of decisions are are devastating you know or magical you know and whenever you talk about the luck thing maybe sometimes it turns around sometimes i feel like that luck goes for seasons i mean when you just mentioned it before when erickson's car launches in the air slams on the ground how is nothing on the front of that bent and he's as fast or faster than anybody at the end of that race i mean talk about luck i i, I mean that's just a straight up lucky moment yeah. i was actually surprised looking back and watching the race that he didn't get like a, a penalty for that actually like i mean and i love marcus and i was i was super happy that he won, you know, and especially with how his race played out and yeah, airborne, yeah. Uh, you know, was 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 cool, really. But I also I agree with you. It, it's it's how competitive IndyCar is right now. And to be honest, I think you might look back at the class of 2021 with all the teams and the drivers, and I'm I'm really proud to be on the grid in a year that is this competitive, and especially be able to show the potential that we have. I mean, it makes me feel good about myself. It makes me feel good about the team. <clears throat> Also, the journey that the team has been on. Uh, obviously, this would be my last season with MSR. Um, you know, but from where we started, the, doing the 517 to part-time to now being able to compete to be in the Fast Six as many times as we have. And, you know, honestly, go to a lot of places and not just push to be in the top 10, but be racing in the top 10, like, regularly and even almost, like, in the top five. Is, is incredible you know it's been the most incredible chapter of my racing career that i've had so far sure, the funny thing about road america is i also was curious as to what dictated the strategy and on the way home i shame a, a slice of casey's pizza and it was awesome because <laughs> i was so mad i was like oh i'm just gonna get home and i stopped at some uh, i stopped at a casey's and they got some spotted cow and i got a slice of pizza and i was like well at least this just takes a little hurt in a way <laughs> You, you know, know what, along with that, I'm just going to, just a quick, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, uh, Michael, but when I spotted for you, and I don't remember what year that was, your first year was 17 at the yeah, 500? Yeah. It might have been that year, yeah, actually. I think so. Um, physically, fit-wise, you were not anything like you are now. You've come a long ways in that area. 
Yeah, I mean, I think cl clearly yes. I mean, there's no other answer to that. Clearly yes. Uh, you know, throughout IndyCar, I, you know, the thing I is honestly, I I always worked hard in the gym. Like that, I don't think any of my trainers would dispute that. The thing I just really dialed into was my nutrition. You know, and that's where the, like, the big weight loss came. Honestly, I, I hardly changed my workouts at all. You know, and I went from being probably 193 to at my very light, it's probably 163. You know, so I mean, it almost was like 30 pounds. And now I've kind of settled in at like a comfortable and strong, like 170-ish, you know, and um, it all came from nutrition. You know, so I think it's easy for people to pinpoint that as like, this is why you have progressed. And, and I mean, to me, it's a little, a little deeper than that. But uh, I think that's on the surface level, probably I the biggest thing. I think it's way yeah. deeper than that, well, but I think it is a piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Oh, it, I mean, yeah. it, even at minimum, if it just shows people how hard and how much I want it, then it, it sets the right example. Well, if it's any consolation, Ken and I still do the Casey's and Spotted Cow daily. Yeah. So that's, nice. that's why. You're in good shape. Well, not as good as so you. So I'm but. going off of that deal. I mean, based off of what you just said, they say you can't work your way out of a bad diet. But as a member of Pit Fit here recently, I'm I'm tr been trying to prove them wrong. I've been working out diligently, but I still yeah. have a bad diet, and I'm like, I'm just going to see if that's really true, you <laughs> know, before I'm, I give up. The <laughs> for someone who their their whole life, you know, from go karting, battled weight, and trying to make weight, you know, and stuff like that, I, I can extremely confidently tell you that you are never you're never going to outwork a bad diet. Thanks, pal. So, <laughs> that just hurts. Yeah. <laughs> that little dagger right there. Yeah, boom, after that. You're like, oh, I just trying to like that guy, and then he comes in. <laughs> All right, well, on that downer moment, we're going to take another quick break here, and we'll be right back on the other side. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Dream Giveaway. Dream Giveaway has been giving away high-end American muscle cars to raise money for charity since 2007. Dream Giveaway is known for giving away classic and new muscle and paying the federal taxes so the winners don't have to. For $25, you can jump in the game, and part of that goes to charity. You'll have a chance at winning some of the coolest cars on the planet. Check it out at dreamgiveaway.com. Welcome back to The Skinny. We have Jack Harvey in the studio with us today. And once again, the track dude, Michael Young, is sitting in for Rico. We appreciate everything he brings to the table, including this guy, Jack Harvey, uh, along with us. Hey, man, we're going to get off the beaten path here of this racing thing for just a moment. Uh, quick question for you. Squash or racquetball? Uh, definitely have more, more fun playing squash. Do you? So you do I know the difference then? I, I actually I had a fun tidbit for you. Now we're off the beaten path. <laughs> I have uh, just recently invested in a brand new racket company that produce squash rackets. Okay. So See, 305 squash, if you ever want to play, so you have you to let know. Me know. All right, so tell me, because I'm a racquetball guy. It's mm. the United States, and that's what we know, yeah. at least more so than squash. What's that heating duct unit at the bottom of a squash court on the front wall? I, I've never understood what that is. Uh, there's mixed. I hear mixed theories on this. I mean, I'm not like a, like a pro squash player or anything. It's just my, my best buddy had a clothing line and he specialized in squash uh wanted to expand so then i you know helped get some of the racket squ uh, uh stock so now you know i'm a bit more invested in and i've always played squash and i love playing it because it's a rubber ball if it's cold it doesn't bounce the more temperature and heat that's in the ball allows it to bounce much more so i think they they try and keep the courts at a particular level just to allow the ball to so it is, a, it is a heater then? Is or it a something? heater? I, I don't know. I mean, honestly, like, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm a kind of a fair weather fair. squash player, you know. And I used to, I play with my manager, who's all but hurt his knee, conveniently, because <laughs> <'cause laughs> he's beaten. Because yeah. <laughs> you're kicking his ass. And, uh, but I like racquetball too. Yeah. Like, I really enjoy playing racquetball. A big difference is though, you know, ball's much bigger, bounces much easier, super American off the bat. And there's not yeah. so many lines. <laughs> in squash, there is a boundary. Like you have right. to keep the ball in a certain boundary. Racquetball. I mean, that's perfect for somebody like me. I can use the ceiling, the side, the back wall, or wherever it's coming off. I was like, just hit it again. It's it's crazy playing <laughs> racquetball because I got uh, he actually the same manager dinged me in the back of the thigh 
with a racquetball. And honestly, I thought I was going to throw up. The pain was so bad. And the thing is, you're looking forward and you're like, the ball's over there. And the next thing you know, it just comes firing at you. And it feels like it just comes at any direction. And I spent half the time in the middle, just kind of crawled up, protecting myself. It's so weird to think that you can turn around and smoke the ball off the back wall, you know, a yeah. racquetball, and, and just get it back to the front wall yeah. and you're okay. Well, and the actual rackets themselves are slightly different too. A squash racket's got a longer handle, a uh, bit more narrow, just but longer in general. Uh, racket balls is like you basically just compressed it so it's a bit shorter it's a bit wider yeah sounds like you brits are trying to compensate for something a little longer handle there and <laughs> you take that however you like <laughs> do you miss Basingham? do you get home much uh i haven't really through covid really so uh, yeah. it's been a while i can't i went back uh for 10 days at christmas last year and that was right where they discovered the south african variant and honestly even didn't it, didn't go. I mean, we were going. We were like, "Oh, sure, we shouldn't." We in the end, we just thought, "We'll we'll still go and we'll play it by ear." And then we saw that America was about to announce something uh, in early January, so we were like, "No, nope, we're coming back. Like, quick, get back before it's uh, whatever. If, if it was bad or anything." And um, yeah, I mean, I haven't been. I've been once in two years now. You know, and mm. the thing is, like, my mum and dad would very often come out to races. They've not been out here for two years either. Actually, my dad was in St. Pete. 2020 so he landed thursday night friday they said they were canceling the race saturday yep. morning he flew back to the uk to get oh, in man yeah so That's we have that. a video for uh, the folks who are watching the video portion of our show which do you prefer the five uh -huh, bells, the bells or, the bu or the bugle horn? Uh -huh, nice the five bells for sure five bells oh big five bells guy yeah <laughs> so i looked inside they actually have a, a gallery of of the inside of the five bells that is a cool little restaurant pub i would say what well, if you've ever watched like any tv shows where you what you picture like a a village pub to be the five bells is it you know it's it's quaint you know the the ceilings aren't straight you know the doors are slanty honestly like the chairs seem like they've been there for like the you know star time the food is brilliant by the way um always hilarious at christmas i mean just a just a great place to go and i would say most of the time pre covid my, the first night I would come back, I'd always end up like in the bells, you know, and it'd be the same group of guys and girls who have been there like the last like 40 years or whatever. You bear in mind, like my, my, my great granddad lived in Baz. My granddad was a regular at the bells. So then when I go in there, I mean, I know everyone. It's a, it's a tiny, tiny village, but I definitely miss being there. Yeah, it's, it's, the imperfections so, make it perfect. Exactly. Yeah. So, what about the bugle horn? What's I like the bugle. I I, uh, I definitely prefer the bells. Uh, the bugle's got a nice atmosphere. The flow of the 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 flow of the uh, the pub itself is separate. As in, and that's important, correct? It, it is because I'm kind of like I'm not sure if I want to be like in one side where they mostly serve food, or if I want to be in the other side just having a good time. And there's no like easy crossover. What is the singing portion in pubs in the Brits? And what always singing? You guys are always singing songs. What's the story with that? How's that? Is this because you just pints and I guess is that? That's why I would call that liquid courage, really. And just singing all the time. Oh, uh, we went. The more you drink, the better you sound. Of course. Uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, like if it's a soccer game, I mean, or just, honestly, just any time, really. If people start like so a few certain songs, I think when you're in the UK, you just. When you're born there, you just kind of innately know these like songs. I don't remember anyone ever teaching me the words. Give us three I songs can't. you must know. Don't you don't have to sing them, but just uh, I would the, honestly I would say Brits aren't as patriotic. Uh, no, they are. They're not as outwardly patriotic as Americans are. But the, when the national anthem comes on, everyone stops and sings it always. Uh, I would say "Old Man's Time" comes out. Right. Everyone starts cracking it. And um, there's a there's a couple of like soccer songs that everyone knows, and I don't know if, if any of you were around me when the Euros were on, but like at Mid Ohio or you're around Carlin or any of those guys when it's coming home, comes on. I mean, it's probably the most obnoxious like <laughs> sports songs like ever come from like the UK and especially about our national soccer team. Now but, you're you're a pastry guy, right? You're you're into pastries. Just bacon, yeah. Just, just general bacon. bacon, yeah. So how did you get into that world? Because because uh -huh. I've always said to you, the English cuisine could be the worst on the planet. 
Well, with, with, with I the, mean, that's with that's the exception strong. of the infusion of the Indian culture coming in and all the curries, which has saved a lot of English it cooking. Sure did. But <laughs> but for for you, you're a pastry guy. Yeah. How did that start? Well, actually, so did you know? Another tip bit for you guys. Okay. Did you know that chicken tikka masala was actually invented in Scotland? I don't believe that at all. I swear to God. <laughs> How in the world does this happen? I mean, probably just like the infusion, I guess. Like probably someone from Delhi ended up just in Glasgow and was like, the food's crap. We're going to make our own. There you go. <laughs> and uh, how did I become a baker? Uh, I mean, honestly, it's super simple. I was bored one day. I started, you know, but I'm sure as we all have done, maybe you guys won't admit to it, but you start watching the Great British Bake Off, you know. <laughs> few episodes in, I'm like, oh, I'm still watching this show. <laughs> Probably halfway through the first season I watched, I was like, oh, Sally's opening the oven door too many times. Like, oh, she didn't, you know, too much flour in that. Or, oh, that's not going to work because she's done this. And I'm like, wait, I don't, I don't fucking know what I'm on about. I mean, I've never baked anything ever. Uh, I was like, oh, maybe I should try this. And actually, it wasn't bad. So then I got a KitchenAid. And then that's really when my baking took off. You got a whole new level. So what was the first thing that you ever baked? I mean, honestly, the first thing I ever baked, classic chocolate chips. I mean, you go to a good pizza restaurant, you can judge how good that place is purely off the margarita. And I feel like good bakers just hit you with the <laughs> classics. Why are you shaking your head? <laughs> Wait, you said you go to a pizza joint? You yeah. mean Mexican and you restaurant. Can, and you can tell if... I'm not going to name more Mexican restaurants with you. Right, by the fair, Wait fair. a minute, you go to a pizza joint, you can tell if the food's going to be good by the margarita, he said. Is that what I heard? That's correct. But th th margarita pizza, what are you on about? Oh, mar <laughs> well, I was thinking of a margarita, of course. Yeah, no, margarita no, no, pizza. No, no, no. <laughs> see, this is... The, this is like you drinking see, a margarita. This is see, a language barrier. The pizza's gonna be good. See what happened there, Jack, is <laughs> all, the, all Ken knows is pepperoni. I know. He, he doesn't know about the margarita pizza. He's a meat, he's pizza a, with a margarita. Right, Absolutely. He's a meat feast and margarita <laughs> guy. I can see it right now. No fruit, no veggies on my pizza. <laughs> Extra right. meat, Absolutely. let's go. All right. Okay, so this is where the language barrier comes in sometimes. You go to an Italian restaurant and you order an Italian pizza called a margarita. That, it's just basic, right? It's just like dough, tomato sauce, like mozzarella. Right. Done. So I was like, okay, I feel like good bakers have like a couple of like staples that you should be able to go and just go, I want a chocolate chip cookie and be like, wow, this is like the best cookie I've ever had. So I started with cookies, slowly got more adventurous. Now I make dough. And the, probably the last, well, not the last really good thing I made, but the last thing that I made that I was like, this is, this is buy worthy. You know, like if you bought it, you'd have been really happy with, I made cinnamon rolls. Oh, really? Yeah. I'll oh, send you a photo. And honestly, I, I'm quite critical of my baking, you know, like racing kind of can't help, but like just always, oh, I should have done this or next time. And so I'll get a recipe, I'll cross stuff out and I'll re like edit it the way I want it. So when I go to bake it next time, I know what to do. Anyway, I made these cinnamon rolls, and I was like, I'm done. Wow. Like, we're tied on a high. <laughs> That's monkey amazing. Bread, I'm, my monkey bread's good now. Really? Yeah, yeah. See? My cakes are okay. So but you got to work on the cakes. I'm, you gotta... I'm, I, I like cake. The problem with cake is it has to be like three tiers. And sometimes I just don't have the patience. I kind of get to like tier two, and I'm like, eh. You need the, the Neapolitan deal you know with all the different colors like that's, a seven layer that's yeah. a, that's an american ice cream where we, we could never figure it out so we did strawberry vanilla and chocolate all in one box yeah you, you know what i'm talking about i like, like that, that idea that's, that's, that's a good that idea. seven layer cake is, isn't it called neapolitan i have no idea I think I said, it's, called, it's an italian cake and i think it's in every layer it's a called a color. margarita pizza i think <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny I, I ages ago when quarantine started for the first time but you know last year uh, my girlfriend for my birthday bought me this Williams and Sonoma like rainbow cake kit, right? So I made it and then it had a great time. I'll send you a picture of that. In terms of like aesthetically pleasing cake, that's the best one I've made. And it was seven, six layers, seven layers. It was a pain in the ass. <laughs> you know, like I wouldn't recommend it. It does look good, but like I haven't... You haven't ventured back down that I road. I haven't ventured back down that road. The thing is, you can make stuff look cool just with like a little bit of coloring. But again, like, if I'm in the zone, I'm in the zone. If you're going to do it, you're all in. I'm all in. And I would say my, my carrot cake, I don't even like carrot cake. Oh, I love carrot cake. Good. Carrot Honestly, cake. I don't like carrots. And I don't know, in my head, I was like, well, I don't want to eat a cake. That I, don't, I don't even like carrots. It's like the main ingredient <laughs> in this cake. I'm not going to eat this. 
anyway, I made it. Someone asked me to make it. I made it. And I was like, oh, damn. Carrot cake's car- quite good. It doesn't take nothing like carrots. Yeah, nothing like carrots at all. This is the biggest win ever. That's awesome. I always get tasked with, and the cake is just out of the box cake, so nothing, nothing fancy on the baking side. But when you say out of the box, what, what, what do you, you mean? know? When you buy the the Betty Crocker, you know, they powder, their... and you put the eggs and water and butter and in, you know, and you yeah. mix it up and then bake it and bake he, it. In he's the shaming oven. you right now. He's oh looking yeah, yeah at no, you. no, I no, that part of it, I, I get, I get. But, Listen, I'm not a super judgy person, but uh, I feel but like I'm judging But I'm always the one when my grandson's birthday comes around. I'm always the one that they put the cake in front of and they say, make something he would like. So you know, I've done the monster truck on you know on the icing stuff. You know, nice. you have the, the roping and the monster jam okay. or whatever it may be. So I'm always the creative. So I find myself same way. Amazon like, that I've got I've got all the different <laughs> nozzles and I've got the knives and the water and so I can make it smooth and you know <laughs> okay hey well, I can respect that I mean I'm, I'm, I'm cool not, with that I'm sitting there, I need a drink I have to have a drink or two it takes me about two hours to do it you know say baking do you know the worst <laughs> bit about baking is cleaning well, oh my god. Yeah. Uh, the the mess that I make clean like uh, bacon is honestly it ends up in place. I'm like, how did it even get there? It's the biggest mystery ever. <laughs> One clap, the flour is everywhere. Uh, everywhere. I'm not an apron guy either. I just yeah. can't do it. You need to do it. I can't. You need to got some hilarious aprons though, by the way. <laughs> So you need to bring one out to the track and just wear it out on the... Yeah, I'm sure the Gracie yeah. would appreciate you wearing an apron and nothing else you know, yeah, while I, you're baking. I think there's a guy who already does that. I think he's the naked baker. Not, I don't know if we can do that. No, like someone else has already got yeah, it. Yeah, you probably That's an do. image that I just... Yeah, yeah I know. It well, made me think of the dancing cow... Or the singing cowboy say, uh, in New York City. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't get me wrong. I know I've got a good time now, but in the winter, this is... I'm going to be pale, very pale, <laughs> very, 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 pale very basing in England. Very, honestly, yeah. this heat right now is just like killing oh, me. My brutal. skin is just going no yeah. you know, the whole time. I mean, I, I, I need some cloud cover. Yeah. You know, I need some cloud cover. I need a bit of mist and just hilarious because I love a rainy day. I don't like being rainy at the track. I like, the, you know, I deal with it. But like a Sunday to me, a, an off weekend Sunday that's raining is like my best day ever. I'm going to bring the duvet to the living room. I'm going to sit on the sofa. I'm going to have a cup of tea on one side. I might even have a coffee. Do both. Why not? It's a Sunday. I get some biscuits out that I like, cookies that I like. And honestly, I could sit there all day. What? So the first thing you were bringing to the living room was the duvet? Yeah. What's that? Uh, well, I don't know. What do you sleep with? A duvet, a comforter. Oh, a blanket. Yeah, yeah, blanket. Okay. I just never heard of that term before. A duvet. Yeah, never heard of that. Ken still has his blankie from when he was a child that he's not let go yet. <laughs> hey, hey. Hey. If it don't works. It. If it works. What do you mean? Never heard of the duvet like before. I've never heard of the term duvet. Have you, Carl? Oh, yeah. Have you? Okay. Do you know, the honestly, the thing... We need I a hate, culture show with I Jack hate, Harvey. Yeah. I hate to say this, but now uh, this is two times where I feel like you've been the odd <laughs> one out here. Something's happening. Listen, it's like, does that duvet me, come with a meat feast If you too? were me, you'd realize that it's way more than two times that I've been the odd man out. So <laughs> I almost feel comfortable out here looking uh, in. We've had a great time here. We're going to let Jack go. He's got a busy week uh, here ahead of him and a lot of racing yet to do on a very warm week, as he just alluded to, with a ton of humidity, too. It's been a rough summer here for these guys in the Indianapolis area, but... Uh, Man, thank you very much for taking thank the time. You. Congratulations on your success. There's no question you're a wheel man. Just need a little bit of things to go your way, and uh, I think we'll see you at the top step of that podium. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for being with us here on The Skinny. This episode has been brought to you by Toyota, Rhino Classifieds, Dream Giveaway, and General Tire. For the latest in sunglasses, optical frames, accessories, and apparel, be sure to check out fatheads.com. That's fatheads with a Z. Production facilities provided by Fatheads Eyewear Studios. All rights reserved.